Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, August 21st, 2022. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Daughter 5, and as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Hey, I'm the Wombat. And the guests today are uh, Red Pirate Higgs, welcome, from Western Canada. The John Richards from over in England Way. Hello. And uh, guest uh, Joe Sky out of Texas. Welcome, Joe. Hello. Um, the Swedish, oh, Swedish Steve's not with us today. Uh, Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition, and souls. And if you think that you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're probably not. In Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over a thousand of us. And we'll tell you more about that group after the mid-show break. Well, bet what's our topic today? We're going over a mailbag today. All listener comments that we have in our backlog, all the ones that we're thankful for. But you know what? I like to think of that as just the appetizer. No, not the appetizers, but like the sweet, sweet, sweet bundles of cherries and on top of a delicious cake that I like to build out of starch and carbohydrates. And I think who better to lead us through that piecemeal slices of deliciousness than our own Dread Power Higgs for our weekly invocation. Please lead us in our invocation. Our noodly lord, who art in a colander, al dante be thy noodles, thy blood be rum, thy sauce be yum with meat as it is with vegetables. Give us this day our garlic bread, and deliver us some carbs, and lead us not uh, into ketoism. For thine are the meatballs, and the noodles, and the sauces, and the grog, whenever and ever. Amen. Amen. So happy to talk to everybody today. I hope everyone's having a good time. Guys, I had a really vivid dream that I had to do a lot of car repairs. And I woke up and I realized that nothing's wrong with my car. I just had a really exciting dream about having to buy all these pieces of equipment. And I was so excited to wake up and be like, oh, I'm going to be such a cool mechanic. And then I realized, no, my car's perfectly fine. I was just like, ah, geez. Oh, well. But you know what? It's not (laughs) bad to be healthy. It's not bad to have a working car. What else can I say? You got to count the genuine moments of happiness and and not take them for granted. Speaking of which, Doubter 5, I'm going to throw it up to you. How you been? Tell me some moments of happiness that you've had last week. Um, well, yesterday I took my bike out again, my motorcycle, rode nice. for a couple hours. That so was a very nice day. It was about 83 degrees. Perfect. Um, I played on my uh, <clears throat> Quest 2 virtual reality, first person shooters and stuff. Nice. I've also got a chess game in there that you have virtual opponents virtually. I mean, you, you got the board right in front of you and you can actually move pieces and stuff. You can it's real nice. the table. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I imagine, I imagine Larry with like the headset and he's just staring like this and like his family walks in and is like, dad, are you awake? He's like, no, I'm just playing chess. I'm waiting for the other guy to move. He's like, you're yeah. sucking up batteries. All right. Uh, John Richards, how you been? What's going on? Yeah, everything's fine here. Thank you. Right. We've got guests at the moment. So there's a total of six children, all girls, as we've done, playing football in the garden and dumping each other in the pool occasionally how many touchdowns have they made so far uh no sorry the wrong game okay 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 pretty ball oh foot association football ah i see i see real football yeah proper proper not bad not bad yeah nice very cool very cool dread pirate tell me some moments of happiness for you what's going on well uh friday we had our uh our monthly past act so uh we gathered together and feasted and and uh, had a good time. And um, I, one of our, or two of our, our newest members are uh, actually uh, planning to get married. And I will be there. Cool. Uh, I will marry them. Very it cool. will be the first Pastafarian wedding in Canada. We're going to break it down here. Yes. Wait. Because, I'm a, because I am a, because I'm an appointed marriage commissioner in British Columbia um the uh, there's only four statements that are required by law to be made by the celebrants um outside of that they can dress it up any way they wish and so uh they've decided to go with the pastafarian theme 
and uh, we will we will really play it up. So, and we're going to record it. We're going to uh, let the news agencies know, local and uh, provincial, so mm -hmm. that uh, we can just uh, pretty well say, "Look, we're here. We're not going away. You better recognize us and get over it." Excellent. We're here. We're here. Get used to it, right? Uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Dred, I got a question for you. You've done marriages before. Have they all been in the U.S.? Like, where have they been, if not Canada? Well, they've all been in Canada. So you said this is the first in Canada? First it's the first Pacifarian, Pacifarian wedding in Canada. Themed, but, themed so were the wedding. other ones not Pacifarian themed? No, no, no. That Because uh, marriage commissioners in, in BC, in Canada, um, they're, they're appointed by the Ministry of Vital Statistics. And it's the secular op option available to people, right? I see. Because the only other marriage celebrants are... Um, are, are of a religious nature so uh this is the secular option that's available to people but like i say um because right currently you know bc doesn't recognize us as a religion right so they can't give me any grief you know like uh, we're playing two sides of the field here and uh either way we're going to get recognized and a little airtime i think is going to happen so guys, I, I'm going to ask one last question. Please forgive me for belaboring the point. So this is a religious optioned wedding where the theme will be Pasifarianism. Is that it? Or is it a secular themed wedding where it's Pasifarianism? Correct. The latter. Okay. Yes. Just to get it done as the secular option, even though yes. it's a religious option. Correct. Yes. You're just causing chaos. That's all. Yes. It is. This is just more, <laughs> this is just more <laughs> Operation Chaos. You're just like stirring the pot. It's like That's this right. is all the same stuff. <laughs> you got, yeah. it. You got yeah, it right. What's, uh, what's the strangest wedding you've ever done? For me, it was the vampire wedding. Mm. No, I, no. Uh, I'm an ordained minister. I can marry people too. Yeah. No, I I did one in um uh in the winter outside in the snow uh and wearing um uh, plaid uh pajamas we were all wearing plaid pajamas oh. and, uh, oh, wow. that was, that's the strangest one so far i've actually so gone to a pirate themed wedding month. before what's that i've gone to a pirate themed wedding before oh, nice. in a suit because no one told me it was pirate themed so i just <laughs> pretended i was one of the hostages hey what's uh, up there, i did a um... A steampunk wedding once uh Ooh, oh yeah i was the the officiant in that one and uh i did uh i married two ladies uh this was before it was legal and we just they just went through the ceremony because they wanted to make it semi-official right wow look at right that cool. it's good on you larry good on you sky Thanks. were you saying more things no nothing important I okay well then let me ask you What's going on with you in the last week? How you been? What tell me some of your happy moments? Uh the past week has been really good for me. Uh I've basically just been studying. Um uh, uh I am re 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 reading Richard Carrier's on the historicity of Jesus. And I'm also reading his book Proving History, which is about Bayesian analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'm Who's the author? Uh, Richard Carrier. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. Yeah. yeah. Do you uh, do you check out Bart Ehrman at all? Uh, I read Bart Ehrman, but I don't really check out his website or anything like that. Okay. Uh, I think he is a top-notch scholar, but I disagree with him on some key issues. Mm -hmm. mm. Guys, that's that's such a scientific topic and no better way to, you know, transition than into some of the scientific comments that we got on some of our last week's episodes. And a lot of these come from Dada's Trading Room, one of the mainstay commenters on the channel. We appreciate it. And mm -hmm. some from some others as well, but we're going to go through them all today. Just want to let you guys know we really appreciate the comments. Feel free to leave them whether you're watching on Larry's channel, Dred's channel, my channel, or on John Richards, feel free to leave a, a plug and we'll we'll get to them in the show. Today's solely dedicated on mailbags. And then if we run out, we'll go into uh, some other topics too. But we'll throw the first one out to John Richards. John Richards, last episode, we were talking about UFOs, Loch Ness, and Bigfoot. Oh my! 
and we were talking about life potentially existing on Mars and some issues that might exist with like a low atmosphere and some of the harsh conditions that are there for life. And so Dada's trading room mentioned that there's actually a place on Earth in Canada, of all places, where the conditions are Mars-like. This environment is under snow and ice where there is no air. Scientists have actually found life there, bacterial life that works in a different way than the bacterial life in oxygen. This fact may signify that there's similar life that's possible on Mars. And the surprise will be if we don't find life on Mars. You can check it out at SETI, Davon Island Research Camp. Uh, comments, let's have a conversation. Dred, you want to go first? Go for it. Yeah, sh sure. Uh, so one of the biggest um, issues with uh, looking for current life on Mars is that it doesn't have a magnetosphere, right? So um, mm -hmm. cosmic rays and, and other deadly radiation um, hits the planet unabated uh, and relentlessly. So, um, you know, back billions of years ago, uh, where it might have had a magnetosphere, um, it would have had the protection that life could have flourished. But uh, at, at this point, they're looking for signs of past life, I think, more than current life. Mm. Uh, just, just for those reasons, right? It's mm. a good point. Yeah, gamma radiation can be a real killer, you know? Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, that's going to say. John, so I, un I understand that tardigrades can survive cosmic That's rays. true. You're right. Mm. Yeah, for years. Yeah, it's, it's, they're really weird organisms. Yeah, yeah they are. But, um, Fair enough. Our, our correspondent is absolutely right. There's a place in the high Arctic region of Nunavut, Canada, which is permafrost, you know, it's always frozen. And so it's pretty hostile. There's salt there as well. And so it's, a, it's miraculous that life has been found there, but it just goes to show- Miraculous, you say? Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Maybe, maybe I'll take I'll take back. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, amazing uh, yeah, or ast go. astounding. Yes, yeah. because uh, awesome is a biblical word too. Yes, it is. No, they <laughs> aren't. Those are just regular words that religion has tried to take a monopoly over. Yeah, yeah. They belong the to us. They belong to everyone. Yeah, we want them back. Give us yeah. back our awesome. Yes. You can keep miraculous. I'll yeah, let you have keep that. But give us keep, let us keep awesome. We have skateboarders yeah. that use it all the yeah, time. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is that um what um Dallas Stingy Bob said isn't quite so surprising because life began on this planet, we're pretty sure, in a non-oxygen atmosphere. Yes, that's and correct. it still exists anaerobically, respiring without oxygen in places where there's no oxygen. In fact, uh, one of our family members has just recovered from a nasty condition called um, necrotizing fasciitis. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I know what that is. Odds are not good on that one. That's for sure. Absolutely. Well, she's she's fine. Thank you. After all, a lot of lot of operations and still dressings being changed, but she's she's making it. But that is a, a condition where a bacterium that normally breathes oxygen is trapped under the skin in a place where there is no oxygen, turns anaerobic and starts eating up your own flesh. So it's not a good idea. But uh -huh. these these organisms do exist yeah. in places where there's no oxygen. In fact, if you've ever drunk a beer or a wine, then you've taken no, a drink. Me, never. <laughs> <laughs> grog, grog, I should have said. Then, then we've taken advantage of anaerobic respiration because that's sure. that's what yeast does when it makes alcohol. So this is this is not a surprising aspect of it. But mm -hmm. as Dredd says, what what's surprising is that it's unlikely to have survived still extant in Mars where there's now no magnetosphere and no um, uh, ozone layer. So Mars is blasted with all the nasty radiations all the time. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood is if the, we ever colonize it, we're gonna have to be under domes or underground because of that. And the other problem it's got is it's so small, it can't retain an atmosphere of any thickness. So yeah. I forget, terraforming it that's my yeah. 
right that's not favorite. enough gravity to maintain an no. atmosphere of any uh, substantial density no. no there's a couple of things i'd love to say it'd be funny if you know the indication of whether or not there's been intelligent life on a planet is if there's a layer of plastic you know <laughs> underneath layers and layers of seismic rock right and yeah, it always if we goes, find a Twinkie wrapper on Mars, we'll know. <laughs> right, right, right. Like it always starts with like the fossil fuels, the oil, and then a yeah, bunch yeah. of drilling lines. And then next yeah. thing you know, just a layer of plastic and then just rock, rock, nuclear radioactive rock, and then rock, 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 and that's it. Right. And you're like, there, there was when the life was. And it can give you a good impression of like, where was intelligent life at what point in time, like cutting a tree and seeing like the rings. The and rings. Like, it was then, How and then they blew themselves up afterwards, and then next, you know, there's no atmosphere. That's what happened. Yeah, there you go. But I know we like to go to tardigrades. Did you guys know there was a bunch of other microorganisms they shot out into space too? There's worms. Tapeworms are also really popular. Uh, yeah. They can withstand radiation. They are they are the the parasite that can grow in your intestines. You can break mm -hmm. them in half, and each segment is its own being. They just feed each other, sort of like like uh, a, a train they like to just push nutrients down yeah. yeah the thing about it is with with parasites you've got to have a a, a, a food animal uh, you know a host uh, and that requires all kinds of evolution before the parasite can ever come about mm -hmm. yeah. so i mean but, it's kind of a, a later thing i would think but yeah. also and, and that's the thing with viruses right <laughs> is that they hijack other cells uh replicating uh machinery in yeah. order to exist they can't they can't exist independent of that but also because they don't follow the same rules as organisms do uh or and most because they don't have organs they well. can also hibernate or basically go into like this non-active state for mm -hmm. long durations of time mm -hmm. and then if they get rehydrated or if the conditions are just right or if they reach a specified temperature they're back alive again even though they've not been active for like yeah. uh, hundreds of years it's just really well, that, that's the premise of alien right <laughs> right? the eggs just sit there dormant until the yeah. guy breaks the little light layer there and right out it pops and sucks his face it's the exact same thing how we had some breakouts where people were going to like egyptian tombs realizing yes. oh there's golden stuff here and next thing you know there's another smallpox outbreak it's just like yeah those right. viruses were just waiting to latch on to somebody and then walk mm. out with them it's crazy yeah. hey john richards what's up interestingly we were talking about this with our guest on free thought hour only last night mm which uh, you can now see as a podcast on Freethought Channel. Very interesting guest. Uh, took, us, took us through the development of complexity. Development of complexity. I highly recommend it. One of our best Freethought Hour conversations. Yeah. In fact, uh, I did want to make a little point on intelligent design here. When you design something from an engineering point of view, you want to make it as simple as possible. The less fuming moving parts, the less parts needed, the less skews needed most simplistic way to transfer energy mm -hmm. from one system to the next mm -hmm. no additional heat no additional movement mm -hmm. we have a lot of complexity in our bodies we have you know twice as many nipples as most people would ever need uh, <laughs> from a population but like when you talk about bacteria that can go under your skin and then convert into a anaer anaerobic state and start mm -hmm. consuming living flesh that is mm -hmm. just more examples in my head of just why would you need that function why why would you intelligently design that when it could lead to yeah. so many problems? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um uh it's one not, last it's not a benevolent god thing, is it? Right. Not a benevolent god, not an intelligently designed zerk. Yeah, not a smart god. Right. right no, right. there's over four thousand genetic diseases that doesn't seem yeah. very intelligent. Yeah. Dread, I'm also going to plug this one. I, I think we should have had a guest from Australia because if there's that much radiation, we can guarantee there's not intelligent life, but it might just be really ugly life on mars <laughs> there you go. Yeah. and i that's not a stab at australians they just mean they have a lot of ugly crazy animals <laughs> out there especially bug life sure enough yes uh dread i'm also going to throw this other one out you at uh, to you this is a question we had from last week but it's not on uh space particles it's more on viruses because we were talking about viruses i'd love to get your feedback on it as well app sure. Kane, uh commented on the episode of ufos Loch Ness and bigfoot oh my uh she asks, hey, I'm going to slightly disagree with the dangers of viruses, that being if aliens were to come to Earth and, and potentially give us their viruses or we okay. go to another planet and we give them our viruses. Mm -hmm. The analogy would be better if every time humans go in the ocean, we have a chance of infecting prawns with human diseases. For us to infect the aliens and vice versa, there would need to be more genetic similarities than life on Earth has. This isn't always the case, 
since some diseases can jump species, but it's a larger barrier than some people take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Fred, yeah. What do you think about that? Uh, just hang on a sec. I got this. Oh. Well, well, while Fred is putting himself out, I'll come in on that. Yeah, you're the biologist here. What's up? Yeah, yeah. So what we're talking about here is zoonosis, the, the transfer uh, of, of diseases between species. And mm -hmm. it is, does happen in both directions. Uh, there's a recent case of a dog having been infected with, I'm not sure whether it was COVID or one of the diseases that was previously found in humans. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's, that's exactly what it is, zoonosis. That is yeah, what yeah. COVID started as. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it came it jumped from it jumped from animals then, to the live yeah. market in Wuhan. On We're YouTube. giving it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. five. Yeah, I was thinking that there might be a, a good argument to be made for the fact that um, life on other planets, if it exists, might have the same DNA structure as us. Mm. And the reason I say that is that uh, all Earth was made of all the common elements. The, the most common elements are the most common here. And that would be the same in other, could be the same on many other planets. And if we started with cert, certain replicating molecules then, that are made out of certain uh, atoms, elemental atoms, why wouldn't that happen on other places as well? I mean, yeah. it could be a very common thing throughout the universe. You never know. Yeah. And then, then they would just develop their DNA pretty much the same way we did. Yeah. Yeah. Dread. yeah uh, actually, I've been listening to some interesting podcasts with, you know, on that very topic and that, uh, that suggests that the, the mystery of life is not really that mysterious. If you look at it as um, chemical, um combination you know, chemical uh, uh actions Legos. that happen naturally and that the first replicators are really just um processes that yeah. happen naturally and take uh, chemical exchanges down to their their lowest state which you know is like uh, photons uh being emitted by atoms by uh you know electrons just moving down into a ground state right it's right. just it's just part of nature it just that's the, how the, how it works it's not yeah. as mysterious as we all think and well, it, and that maybe the, the very precursors to life are just these natural chemical yeah. processes yeah. that generated the first replicators and those replicators just mm -hmm. become more complicated yeah. and emerge life then being sort of a just an emergent property sure yeah absolutely but it doesn't have to be necessarily a decrease in energy level. I mean, I, I know sometimes that happens. In fact, in, in the case of crystallization, the reason that the particles come together into that format is because they, they contain less energy then than when they're buzzing around in a solution. So yeah, but you, you think about mitochondria and the yeah. adenosine triphosphate, the, the that cycle there, <laughs> yep. where yep. Where it adenosine triphosphate ATP yeah. turns into ADP diphosphate, and so that's a loss of it is in that case, but it needs atom, right? But then it's, a it's, a, it's an exchange in energy. Well, to complete to Sorry. complete the cycle, you need to pump in some energy to yeah, restore course, yeah. the ATP, and of course that can happen in lots of places it's in the universe where there's energy being released by massive stars for example so it, yeah, it can be a build-up as well as a in other words it's, it's an exchange it's, it's, it's what it is it's yeah. an exchange yeah it's a pump so what we're basically saying is there could be localized native states or low energy states towards the lowest energy state where a molecule is happy enough to be right there because it might even take more energy for it to get to the next transition point yeah. And so it will settle on its way down, sort of like going down steps of stairs, right? Yeah. And because of that, just because we see how life works here on Earth may not necessarily mean how it works in other places, but it could also mean that we are trajectorying, since we're all working on trial and error using the same base parts, there might be a lot of similarities in space somewhere to life here. And sure. from my point of view, the only thing I'm saying is two things. One, it'd be really polite of us not to try to contaminate another planet when we see it. And we should be thoughtful how we approach another intelligent life, whether it's using robots that might use a lot of radiation or emissions to sig send signals back to Earth. 
that might yeah. be sensitive to the life forms that are on that planet. Like they might hear Wi-Fi, for example. And I'd be like, man, why is this robot screaming Wi-Fi? I, he I hate it. It's like, <laughs> we can't hear it, but maybe they can. Who, uh, who knows? Something weird like that. But the other thing is, if we took the inverse and we replaced it, it and uh, an alien visited us and it like, we're so happy. We have the White House all surrounded by this thing. And he comes or he or it comes out of the spaceship and it's just sneezing and it's like coughing and it's pooping on the floor. It's like, oh, 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 please get back <laughs> in your spaceship. Uh, That's right. It's like, I won't contaminate you guys. I won't. Don't worry. We're it a mask. different life forms. It's like, yeah, this is a lot. We didn't want this. <laughs> this is a politeness this is thing, you know. In my head, it's directive stuff, isn't it? Never think of sick aliens. <laughs> we don't want your sick aliens. <laughs> uh, Dread, one extra question for you before we get into more science stuff. Uh, sure. Dread, um, have you ever thought about a noodle themed turban? Maybe your problem in Canada <laughs> is distinctive head covering. Well, that's so the common, think, isn't it? Noodle theming. So it sounds like you could probably get away by wearing a turban and have noodles on the turban have somebody knitted a pattern, at a white like a pattern. yeah 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 we've we really have tossed these ideas around um but again it's it's arbitrary right so right right right, um, right, right, right. you know i mean i've i've actually talked to uh you know, a couple of my Sikh friends who would be willing to dress me up in a turban and i pose that question actually to uh the uh, uppity upset uh, ICBC to say, you know, if I go in and claim I'm a Sikh, what, like, what would you do? Would you say you can't possibly be a Sikh because you're not the right color? You know what I mean? I mean, wow, that's up. <laughs> seriously, seriously, right? Because no Sikh, you know, of uh, Indian uh, <clears throat> ethnic origin is ever questioned. They, nobody says, are you, what religion are you? You know, and, and certainly nobody at ICBC likely, you know, who isn't a Sikh, likely knows what Sikhism is all about. They couldn't they couldn't tell you um, what Sikhs believe or even what uh, uh, Hindus believe or anyone else that isn't Christian because they don't really care. Right. Cool. They're just they're, they're very myopic, you know, and and, and I'm certain that Sikhs only got. Uh, the right to wear their turban after considerable pro protest um, and just by sheer numbers, right? Yeah. So speaking of irrational conclusions, let's talk about hypothetical particles. Do you want, you want to get into that? Right? Well, can we so, take a break? That's a nice segue. <laughs> We're kind of at the bottom of the hour. We are we? Are we already? To, okay, yeah. okay, okay. So we have so many more comments to go through, guys. We'll go yeah. into the, uh, in the next half. So. Yeah, stay tuned for the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville for just a second. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 20th year and have over a thousand members. We have weekly in-person meetings in Knoxville's old city at Barley's Taproom and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top tables or if it's pretty weather outside on the deck we also have a tuesday evening ask zoom meeting and if you'd like to join us email us at ask an atheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or let's chat se at gmail.com and we'll send you the link you can also find ask online at facebook meetup.com or at their website meetup i'm sorry knoxvilleatheist.org or you can just google knoxville atheist it's just that simple by the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Mm. Don't find one. Start, Start one. One bet. Where do we want to pick up? Hey, we're going to be talking about mailbags and all the listener comments that have come through. We got everybody, and we're highly happy to have so many wonderful comments to go over. They inspire a lot of conversations, and feel free to add more. Uh, we're going to go straight into it. Dread, um, two comments for you regarding uh the right to education from the show right to education we were talking about particles um first question is dread you need to deliver so it's about entangled particles we were talking about that right, right. um how do you measure entangled particles 
if they are instantaneous and they're faster than the speed of light, how can we detect them if nothing we have is faster than the speed of light? That's the gist of the both of those part of questions. I'm not saying you do have the answer. I'm just wondering, it's a good thought experiment. How do you measure something that's immeasurable with our current techniques? And I think you're right. You, you just said it there. It's, a, it's more of a thought experiment. It's the math that makes sense. Mm. Um, so, you know, this idea that, you know, you could measure uh, uh, your, you could determine that particles are entangled that are light years apart. Mm. Of course, mm. that's impractical in terms of actually measuring these things to demonstrate that that's the case. But certainly the math uh, is pretty sound and, and that's more what it's being relied on mm. than actual, it's a thought experiment. Yeah, as yeah. opposed to a yeah. real experiment, right? I love mathematics because that it gives you the freedom to be able to do it because you're working with such well-defined variables. Rarely yeah. that you get three of anything in real life, but in math, you yeah. can just declare three, even prove three, and just work with those assumptions that you have these well-defined things. And yeah. I think thought experiments I mean, have their place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Richard Feynman, uh, you know, Feynman, one of the you know one of the greatest minds of uh, the current era. Um, he said that he doesn't understand quantum mechanics and that anyone that makes that claim probably doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it works, right. You know, that we have, uh, fMRIs and, uh, you know, different uh, technologies that are, you know, totally reliant mm -hmm. on the fact on the math that mm -hmm. quantum mechanics is the case, but a lot of people, you know, there's still a lot of, uh, unanswered questions with respect to what it really is all about. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, uh, just on the 16th of this month, uh, a bunch of uh, pr prominent scientists met in Vancouver to start the Quantum Gravity Institute, which mm -hmm. is a, a new institute, uh, well-funded, uh, that is going to explore the connections between Einstein's uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics, because oh. that's still currently uh, yeah. a big mystery right now. And right? Also we, we still thing too, oh, skepticism of quantum mechanics is not the same thing as dismissing that their ideas are actually accurate or true. The default position of science is, I don't know, or yeah. we can't reach a conclusion yet. Yeah, and we and still don't have a grand unified theory. So right, right, right. Hopefully so they'll find one. A and, lot of the and, times, oh, I'm just going to finish. A lot of the times when we're talking about these theories, it's because we're looking at these unknowns and trying to come up with narratives or, or uh, thoughtful experimentations to try to come out with standards. And the cool thing about standards is those can be tested. Those can be demonstrated. Those have utility. Mm -hmm. But some thought experiments have utility too, even though they haven't been converted or precipitated down to a standard yet. And so yeah. uh, we work with the thought experiments lacking any sort of <clears> measurable or a feasible way to measure these concepts that we're talking about, but we may precipitate them into better standards when we have that technology or have that capability in the future. Who knows? That's right. But at least until then, it's not that they don't exist. It's just that we don't know. And I think it's okay to say you don't know in science or if something's yeah. undefined to say it's undefined or inconclusive at this point. Yeah. And, and a very important, people. yeah, I was going to just say that uh, to add to that, that a very important aspect of uh, science and an, under, an appropriate understanding of it is that scientific theories are models, yeah. mm -hmm. right? They're only right. models of yep. the way we think the universe works. Right. It, there's, it is not direct experience. Mm. You know, that we, they're, they're just how we model things and how we understand them. It's not, right. it's not necessarily the absolute way it works. It's and, just and, how our understanding is. And by that, I mean, even like things that we think we have a very strong grasp on, like gravity, like that's yeah, the model, yeah. right? And that, that might be something to change as we learn more about gravitational forces in the future, right? Yeah. John, it sounds like you're you about to say something. Go on ahead. Well, most of what I was going to say has been said now, actually, but uh, it, what, we what we're looking at here is the difference between conceptualizing, which mm. is maths, you know, yeah. and observing which is mm. the science bit and we, we've conceptualized gravity and we've conceptualized uh, quantum mechanics and right. those models sometimes have a decent match to what we observe right. in which case we run with them while they're working but then who knows what we're going to discover tomorrow 
we've certainly, if we look back, we've certainly been it found it necessary to change, to ditch old models and change them for new models, like the model of gravity, uh, which has changed from Newton's laws of motion to relativity. These are all thought experiments. Right. And there's, there's no way of saying that they are congruent with reality. We just run with them until they're falsified. Yes, that's right. And it's a Bayesian... It's a Bayesian thing, right? With the understanding all, that they all, are all new evidence goes on our priors. Right. Yes. As, with the understanding that as long as the math checks out, we can run with these until we have problems or improve yeah. them. But we understand yeah. that they are models. They are functionally yeah. models, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, in the case, and in the in the case of um, entanglement, hmm. it's, it's a mathematically sound idea. But until we find some way of separating one of the partners and sending it a hundred thousand miles away and right. altering this one and, and observing that one change simultaneously it's right. not being evidenced right right it's, it's all it's all true in principle yes right it's the equivalent of packing your suitcase for an ideal trip to japan that you haven't really gotten the tickets for or anything like yes. that yet but you have the suitcase ready to go in yes. the event that the you got the tickets but until exactly. then we can pack the tickets we can put chopsticks in there we can do all sorts of stuff <laughs> subway maps all sorts of stuff we're free to do that <clears throat> in the right headspace but we haven't gotten the tickets yet that's Without a very fire. good analogy and we were talking about this last night with uh, um chet anderson hmm. and it's it's the difference between nominalism right. which is the the understanding that We've got something going on in here which doesn't necessarily match something out there right you know like numbers are all conceived there's no right. if you look into the universe you won't find a three exactly right, you know? yeah. we we apply the concept of three onto abstract three. concepts yes exactly we apply that onto three points in the universe and, and designate it a three but the, the alternative of course is platonism where Plato used to think that there must actually be a three out there that we have to discover <laughs> and, then, and, and then identify it. And, and so he thought, for example, that somewhere there was a cow, you know, in yes. reality that you had a, a access to so that you could compare what you observed with this, this um, ideal what would you call it? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like the 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 standard yard yeah. <laughs> a the, lump absolute. Of metal. the absolute yeah yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> absolute the world doesn't. the world doesn't work like that no that plato was wrong he was doubt <clears throat> five go for it uh, yeah getting back to the question of being able to to test um <clears throat> quantum linking and and all that at, at extreme distances we don't have to take them light years apart i mean we can measure time down to a nanosecond now <clears throat> and if we could get uh two particles separated by the width of the earth say or between earth and the moon <clears throat> i mean light takes us a uh, one and a quarter second just to get to the moon if you could get a particle there and we could we could test whether it instantly flips or not uh, with current technology yeah, yeah but or, that, that would be in defiance of the uncertainty principle right heisenberg's uncertainty you can't both know the vector a particle is traveling in and it's uh and well, we're, not, we're not worried about its its vector or traveling or any of that we're talking about its state true you know, uh, in more simplicity we just don't have down. a we, we don't have a piece of equipment that that fast yet and then after we determine, after we have a piece of equipment that is that fast, is it that piece of equipment operating on the same thing that we're trying to prove in the first place? Because that's a problem. Because if you have a, if you have a, a machine that measures quantum entanglement that's powered by quantum entanglement, how do you verify that quantum entanglement actually works? It seems like you have a biased piece of equipment. Because I can yeah. make a magic detector that runs on magic that always says it's it's magic, right? It's just <laughs> gonna have a piece of tape on a box that just says it's magic. And I just run it around the room and just be like, hey, it's all magic, guys. And this runs on right. magic. So therefore, it's but, right. But that, that that was what I was saying about uh, certain technologies that already exist mm -hmm. that make use of the principles of quantum mechanics without necessarily being able to prove certain aspects of it are true experimentally. Right. 
right? And I and so I would say entanglement is already being taken advantage of in certain technologies by virtue that it works in principle, that the math is right. Mm, and and it also, doesn't take it doesn't take a demonstration that these things are true experimentally because they work in practice. But that is that is also something that we should be considered as I, I'm going to use a word here. Don't don't forgive me for using it, but that's a dangerous path to go down only because when we standardize something, it's an actual approach where we don't use the, the word and the definition in, in the simplest sense. You have to have a alternative strategy to test something rather than just here's the thing I'm trying to test and here's the method I'm using, which is the thing I'm trying to test. And therefore it works. It's like, that's not a, that's not a standard there. It wouldn't pass any sort of standardizing body. It has to be a, a different means to test it. And it has to be in a, uh, a well-tested regular way to test it. Um, what, you say, not, Scott? That's not a, this, that's not a declaration that it's non-existent or not trainable or not uh, e e existent. It's just, you have an inconclusive way to test it. So we, the default position is it's inconclusive which is, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means we don't have a way to test that in a reliable way. And I think the more reliable way we can test it, the more we, confidence we can put on it actually existing. And if it's useful in the meanwhile, fantastic. But until then, we need a way to test it that's better than just, eh, part of it's kind of working because Jerusalem exists in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that Jesus did, right? Or or God does. Like we can or pull New York and Spider-Man. Like, exactly, like New York and Spider-Man. So like we have to like really, really hone down <clears> our <throat> methodologies here. John Richards, I saw your hand up. What's up? Well, I was a bit confused because uh, we were talking about in practice and experimentally, and I think they're the same thing. Mm. Are we say testing that. the same thing or are there two things that are correlating to each other? Like they're how correlated. are you proving that one is it causing the other? Or are you just saying these two things are the same? And we're testing in two different capacities in two different places. Well, like, I mean, if you if you create a circuit or something that that depends on a, a, a physical principle and the circuit works um, and repeatedly works and and works in many different states and many different um, occurrences, couldn't you say that those are the scientific uh, experiments proving the principle is correct? Unfortunately, yeah. it looks like. I don't believe you can. There are, if there is, if that was, if you could be proven that that's the only way that could happen. For example, I'm just going to throw this one out. Why not? What if pixie magic existed and pixie magic is the thing that's causing these entangled particles to flip and swap? And that's an option. Well, it's, if I prove that it's the scientific thing and not pixie magic, great. But until then, you still have pixie magic on the table. And so how do you prove that it's not pixie magic? There's could be a wealth of other <clears throat> credential scientific possibilities for a lot of these things that we're working on. The way how we define that it's one and not the others is by standardizing our process. Well, and I don't think we have the tool sets necessary to like standardize entangled particles. We can make use of them through models that are useful, but I don't think we have gotten there yet. Go yeah. ahead, everyone, raise your hands. So, so this on, is, uh, and, and this is what I was getting to because uh, until recently, no, we haven't been able to image an atom. Um, yet uh, the our whole society is predicated on atoms existing uh, through our current understanding of, the, of how they are, uh, you know, at first it started with Rutherford and the gold foil experiment, right. and then Niels Bohr came up with the, uh, the, the idea of uh, quantum or quanta, right. quantized uh, orbits and all this kind of stuff. So despite our lack of understanding of how things really work, the principle that they work in the ways they do as we model them are are the important points because that's how our that's how our technology works it works on the premise that the understanding we currently have of how things work is true and correct despite the fact that we cannot necessarily uh image or prove definitively that these things work in the way that we think they do if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Models are, so I, I dread you're hitting a good point. The models are still useful even if our understanding takes time to catch up to them. Yes, yeah. And Our models can be is, incomplete, but we still must, we, I mean, that's, this is what I was saying about this uh, physics uh, uh, gravity, uh, quantum gravity institute being started right. because there are many unanswered questions with respect to how quantum uh, mechanics and, and uh, special relativity work together. This is the grand unified uh, theory at uh, um, 
Dutter Five was talking about, mm. uh, or the theory of everything, toe, as they call it. Um, Dread in the interest of time, I I, I yeah. wanted to I wanted to maybe hopefully condense this <laughs> and we can continue this. I'll make another topic, okay. but I like to think of it as like a, a, a lunch table, a lunch table, and you have like philosophers on one side of the table. Then you have like your theorists, your mathematicians. As you work your way down, you have your scientists who are like, hey, these are really good ideas. I like listening to these guys. And right next to them, you have your engineers who are like, you got to make this applied and practical because you're not following objective testing protocols. Like if you actually want me to build this, if you want this to actually work, what are you talking about? Put it in like actual, you know, uh, tolerances for me. And so like when I hear hey, it's working on the philosopher's side of the table. It's like, this works, guys. This makes sense. On the engineering table, it's just like, what are you guys talking about? Please make this make sense. And That's so right. it's, it's like, like, like Sheldon Cooper says, uh, you know, engineers are the Oompa Loompas of, uh, of science, right? <laughs> They're the they no things, nonsense. They make things happen. <laughs> right, right, right. And so mm-hmm. I say, you know, it's fun because all this whole table is what's propelling <clears> science <throat> forward. But it's, it's, int- it's most important that we realize that each side has its function and it's worthwhile to listen to what all the whole table saying and not necessarily be persuaded by just one side. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, again, the default position of science is that's, isn't, it's not true. It's, you got to prove it better or, or come to a better conclusion or, or use a better methodology to demonstrate it. And it's mm-hmm. good to be skeptical in the meanwhile. Um, any, so we got a lot of comments. I'd really, really like to get through them. Uh, Joe Sky, did we get to the one? We haven't gone to yours yet. Let's see. So Joe Sky, we had a question from someone who asked if you had seen the original oldest images of Jesus in an art piece called Earliest Depictions of Jesus in Art. It's a collection of art by Useful Charts. And what's interesting is in the earliest ones, he's a guy who looks like a typical Roman dude without any beard and wearing a Roman tunic and a mantle and not a toga. And then later on, he has curly hair depicted of uh, people of that time period, all the way down to a sculptor <clears throat> who sculpted his face, who looks, the, the final work looks just like the sculptor himself. And what do you think about that? <laughs> of course. How about that? I have not seen these particular pieces of art. What I have seen is some fourth century art where Jesus does look Palestinian. And the interesting thing is, is that some of these art pieces depict Jesus performing his miracles with a magic wand. Okay, <laughs> not bad, not bad, not bad. Uh, John Richards, do you from, have any thoughts? Was it from Harry Potter, that wand? No. <laughs> was you wearing round glasses? <laughs> John Richards, do you have any more comments on that? Well, uh, images of early images of Christ, I think the oldest one is in a a Greek frieze where he's depicted as a toddler and he strangely resembles Apollo. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I I don't know if you've ever seen uh, 22 uh, Jump Street, the movie. Oh, I think I've seen the TV show. Is it? It, Well, there there was the movie that came out much, much later. and uh, of course, uh, 22 Jump Street was a church wherein was uh, a Vietnamese uh, Jesus on the cross. And uh, there, there was a big joke about that. It was, it was a very funny part, but uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway. Larry, I'm also gonna throw this question out to you. Uh, um, I've seen Santa Clauses that are white. I've seen Santa Clauses that are black. And it's just depending on like where I'm going to, I've seen Korean Santa Clauses. I feel yeah. like, do you feel like there's a similar tie there where people just see what they want to see in their jesus especially you, if they live near places that are surrounded by big pieces of butter have For you sure. seen santa claus on a cross i've seen mecca <laughs> jesus <on a cross. laughs> no a friend, no, a friend you... of mine in japan took a picture of a department store display around christmas apparently the japanese love christmas nice but uh they don't quite get it and in the picture uh, there was a Santa Claus on a cross. Mm. <laughs> nice. How, <laughs> how can he you know, deliver the, the presents? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, how will he deliver the presents? So dark. They had a they had a um, a, a theory in movies where a lot of them follow the Christ narrative, like Star Wars, Matrix. 
a lot of these have like the main character basically do all the points where he's persecuted for trying to do something that's good and then comes back after a period of absence to kick the bad guy's butt and and inspire a lot of people to be better than they already are like that is like a trope in storytelling that probably predated the bible well joseph uh, you're familiar with joseph campbell and that joseph campbell actually uh, assisted um, George Lucas in in fashioning that story mm. based on uh, the themes in uh, you know throughout history in mythology you know mm. the, the downtrodden the the un um, you know the uncooperative hero who right. you know thrust you know thrust to the forefront of a destiny that he never anticipated. Mm-hmm. Right? Speaking of being thrust into a, uh, a destiny you never anticipated, let's talk about hell. Larry, we've got a question from hell for you. Have you <laughs> no, ever heard no, of no. modern hell? Stick away. And yeah. the burning in fire hell is just called the old hell. The new hell is a psychological hell where one is tortured psychologically, like a sinner is presented with a situation preparing them to satisfy their lusts, but they can never get that satisfaction. Have you ever heard of those two hells, Larry? All I heard of the first one, of course, uh, the new one is not... I'm not that familiar with, but if it if it uh, is <clears throat> contingent on the existence of a soul, I think we're in the same problem we had with, with the early hell. Uh, I don't believe that souls exist. Every other living thing on the planet dies, and we believe that that's it. It's over. But not humans. No, we've got to live forever. No, I, I don't believe that we do. I don't believe that souls are real. I don't believe they go anywhere after they die. Of course, for that reason. So. You know, new the new hell has the same problem as the old one. Not bad, not bad. Are we getting close to the uh, end of the show? I think pretty close. Time, you for, time final, for final words thoughts. here. Uh, I'll throw one last uh, uh, log into the fire. Maybe we can do a, a longer form episode on sciences because we seem to, we seem to all love that. But yeah. I'd say I've done some SC with a friend of mine who's at work, and he was telling me during while we we're in the parking lot just chatting up after a game of disc golf that. Um, Either the universe came from nothing or God made it, right? Because those, to him, those are the only two options because he looked around and everything to him looked like it was made by God and designed by God. And the only alternative he can consider was nothing, which didn't make any sense to him. And I'd say like the idea that you've reduced your options to a false dichotomy to whether it's the thing that you really like to be true is correct or something completely unreasonable is a false way to prove something is actually true. The way that we demonstrate that things are true when we standardize it is by looking at the process that we're inspecting and making sure each point connects to a logical connection, which means that we need a way to test it that doesn't rely on the premise that we're talking about. And since we don't have a God detector or anything that can measure miracles, we can't claim that God exists on the scientific point of view. God is inconclusive. It's not a default. It's It's not a default. But that that same methodology applies to any other thing that the the theorists that are talking about on the other side of the table, even if we're sitting at the same science table, if they're talking about something that we can't test, doesn't mean that it's not true, just means that we've reached an inconclusive conclusion that their method actually works. And if they say, well, it works on these other things, like that's great, but we're not talking about those other things. We're talking about the, the fundamental thing that we're all trying to get from point A to point B, and we don't have a way to test that yet. It doesn't yeah. mean that it's not true. It means we can still make useful things out of it. That's fantastic. That's even better than what God is giving mm. us right now. Mm. But we can't conclude that it exists until we have a better way to work on it. And that's our new problem. And we can work on that together. So let's work and on in that. In the together. meantime, hmm. in the meantime, it's perfectly all right to say, I don't know. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the most right. honest answer sometimes. And you yeah, shouldn't God. be persecuted for it, God. We'll talk about that maybe in a future episode. Dread mm-hmm. Pirate, what would you like to plug? And feel free to throw your stuff out. You can find me Let's Chat on these YouTube. Feel free to leave a comment. We'll go over them in the uh, future episodes. Yeah. Well, you can find my stuff on my YouTube channel. It's Mind Pirate, M-I-N-D-P-Y-R-A-T-E. I live stream this at 7 a.m. on Sunday mornings, Pacific Daylight Time. And I also do the... Uh, global atheist news review at 11 a.m sunday mornings hmm. um pdt and i'm uh, looking forward to doing that later this morning yep uh yep. yeah click and subscribe love to see you cheers cheers all right uh john Richards, what do we got well yeah as dread said even you too ty will be in uh, you've both accepted thank you it will will be on the panel of glan rev global atheist news review in a few hours and that's on free thought channel where 
all our other stuff is, including the Free Thought Hour interview show that I referred to earlier on in this show. John, my only umbrance with, with you on a deeply personal level is that tugboat will never get to the, the left side <laughs> of your screen. It just it just it's, really bothers me. It's just like it's kind of <laughs> oh, you pushed it back again. <laughs> Guy, anything that we should you recommend we check out before next week? Um, my content can be found on Facebook on the Novafidian Chronicles. Nice. Uh, I talk about things of interest to atheists. I talk about uh, biblical historicity. Um, well, it's my blog. I talk about what I feel like. <laughs> nice nice it's your blog you should be able to do it. it's your party and you can do whatever you want daughter five anything that you'd like to plug before we're out since you haven't written any books about atheism mm, yeah i do have a book out it's uh, called atheism what's it all about it's on amazon uh, my content generally can be found at digitalfreethought.com be sure to click on the blog button it'll take you to our radio show archives atheist songs and many articles on the subject uh, if you have questions for the show, you can send them to Ask an Atheist at KnoxvilleAtheist.org or Let's Chat SE at gmail.com or just leave a comment below the videos. If you're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, you can find help in recovering from religion at recoveringfromreligion.org. Uh, remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real until then don't sweat it enjoy your life and we'll see you next week say bye everybody bye everybody bye, -bye. i'm in <laughs> i'm in